Well, turn with me back in your Bibles to the book of Acts and chapter 9, the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. Um, and we will continue our series through the book of Acts. Now, in the, in the last two sermons, we've had to look closely, have we not, at the, um, the subject of conversion, as I, I've been saying in, in chapter 8, that, that great business of the church was, was brought before our eyes, that the church continued to proclaim the gospel and to expect and to experience conversion. Well, it's not an exaggeration, I don't think, to say tonight that this evening what we are beginning to consider is the most uh, significant conversion story or experience related to us uh, in the New Testament and, and maybe in the entirety of the Christian history, um, the conversion experience of the Apostle Paul. Um, probably is also the most well-known uh, Christian conversion. So uh, there's a saying which is passed down into our, our English language as well. Um, from the biblical narratives, we say someone has a, a road to Damascus experience. And we, we say that to you know, expect, express someone going through like a significant uh, dramatic change in their ideas of belief, a dramatic turnaround in their lives. We say they that was my road to Damascus ex- experience. Well, um, this is this is what is referred to, um, and, and um, the Apostle Paul's experience of the the risen Christ on on that road to Damascus. On a road to Damascus, uh, he was heading to to persecute Christians. He was going there to um, destroy, in his own mind. This, uh, this, 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 this faith that these believers were building and ended up being maybe the most faithful worker in building uh, and helping to build that temple that has ever been the Apostle Paul. I, I can't remember what sermon I was preaching on and I, and I made reference to this, but I said that uh, there was there's like a, this popular lingo today well, I think it's social media lingo, to be fair. I think it is. We speak about protecting something at all costs. So if there is an idea or a person that kind of has serious cultural value and we want to make sure that they're defended against slander or maybe some kind of systematic dis, uh, dismantling that we see encroaching, we're like, no, you have to protect this idea at all costs, protect this person at all costs. So don't let them change our views of them or diminish their importance and so on. We say we protect them at our cost. And I think this is a, the kind of clarion call that has to be made to Christians today. Protect Paul at all costs. That is, um, recognize this man's importance to the Christian faith as God would have it. Don't let folks diminish his importance. Don't let folks sully his his legacy or his reputation uh, recognized the unique role that Jesus Christ gave the apostle to play in the furtherance of his church and the furtherance of the gospel. I don't think it's overstating the case when we put the right boundaries on it to say that Christianity would not be what it is today apart from the ministry of the apostle Paul. As God would have it, that's what, how God chose to do it. Um, but uh, the, the the global faith that the Christian that Christianity is the um, the the depth at which Christians are, are are not are able to mine the significance of the Messiah and his saving work oh so much to the ministry of the Spirit through this particular person particular figure. It's something that's borne witness to by the scriptures themselves, whether it's the way, the, the way Luke records his own account of the beginnings of the church, whereby significant uh, attention is given to Peter, but also given to Paul, or the fact that he, Paul has written by far the most letters in the New Testament, the most would call it books in the New Testament, written by the Apostle Paul. Um, uh, 
there's no doubt about the significance of the Apostle Paul. And as, God, as Christ would have it, it means that any undermining of his apostolic authority by enemies of the faith, really, and opposing voices is dangerous to a faithful Christian witness. Um, and uh, you see that still present today. Those who would like to, um, they would like to um, decry the apostle. And it's interesting because in his day, he was very conscious of that. He was conscious, even in his time, of those who opposed him. He often wrote to churches acknowledging that there were those who would, oppo who would oppose his ministry, oppose his person, oppose his authority, uh, oppose his teaching. And he called them essentially enemies of Christ, enemies of the cross. Um, in a different, perhaps, context in that day, something that is very pertinent to us as well. You know, there are those who would like to pit Jesus against Paul today. They want to say, I only follow the Gospels. I don't follow Paul. And, and, say, and, and paint Paul as some kind of imposter. And we must be sensitive to that. Uh, a church that begins to prior, uh, prioritize the Gospels or something like that over Paul is a church that's very soon going to turn away from the Gospel itself. Um, I remember... I used to always be, I used to, I used to dislike those red letter Bibles. You know, your, your, the, the words of Jesus Christ are written in red. Now, I'm, I, I'm not so much, I don't have the same passion against it, zeal against it, so don't tear your red, red letter Bible up at the moment. But I used to always be so wary of them because I thought they were, and they were to some people anyhow, they were, they, they, they were supporting this idea that, you know, maybe the gospel and Christ's words were the important words in the Bible. You could do what you want with the rest. Now, now, apart from understanding why those Bibles exist, let's be clear, in one sense, all of the scriptures could be red letter. In one sense, certainly all the New Testament is red letter because we believe that it's the spirit of Jesus Christ who has preserved all those words for us. Um, and so, you know, increasingly, I think it's, it's, going, to be, it's a, going to be a significant point of faithfulness for the church, what they make of Paul's work, what we understand about him, um, that he was not an imposter, that he was inspired, um, that there are no contradictions in the words of the Apostle Paul and the words of Jesus Christ. That's another thing that some folks would like us to think, that Paul's words contradict to know, uh, Paul was a witness to Jesus. Jesus Christ chose, uh, again, I, have, I, had a, I had a membership class, I had my membership meetings on Sunday afternoon, and, and this afternoon we looked at the authority of Jesus Christ. I was saying to, to, sorry, the authority of the church, the authority that's in the church. And I was saying to the from there, Jesus is the only head of the church. He's the ultimate authority. But there's a way that he, almost if you want manifests it. There's a way he demonstrates his authority in the church. And one of the ways is through the apostolic authority, through apostolic authority, is, is through the, uh, the authority that he has given the apostles. Um, and it's very true then, and that's true about what we make of the apostle Paul, to oppose him is to oppose the authority of Christ. To oppose his authority in the scriptures is to oppose the authority of Christ. Paul was not the founder of Christianity. He never claimed to be. Right? It just pleased God to use him in that way. And there's nothing to be ashamed of in saying that. Um, and as I say, I think there's, there's, a, there's a serious sense about the test of a faithfulness of a church today. At one level, of course, about, by, by saying, what does this church make of Paul? What does this church make of him? When a, when a church sees him as a, as a problem, as a troublemaker, um, as one that gives us problems, that church is heading towards the path of unfaithfulness. That church is, um, that church is, um, is, is being tempted to compromise. Um, because what the Apostle Paul did was he was called to reveal, to be used by the Spirit, to reveal the mind of Christ. That's, that's Paul's desire, never to, to make up his own doctrine, his own ideas, 
but simply to speak what was Christ's mind. And even for Paul, but I think just in the grand scheme of the New Testament, one of the things that is very beneficial, very helpful for us to maintain this view and to see that this view is true, is actually to look at this road to Damascus experience, the conversion of experience of Jesus Christ, of um, the Apostle Paul, is, is one of those things that is helpful for us just to look at and to reflect on and to see um, that, yes, it's true that Jesus Christ did call this man a unique way. That, yes, it's true, there was no chance that the Apostle Paul went, out, went, went, went on to try and create something for himself. There's no chance that he, what he did he, was he sought to make a name or religion for himself. That this was a man who was consumed by the glory of Jesus Christ. And that the church has always, at least eventually, always believed that. Church saw that. Luke's, Luke doesn't stutter in his record, in his record of, Jesus, of, 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 of Paul. In this, in this, and in this record of his, conversion of, of his conversion experience, Luke is clear this man saw the living Jesus and was commissioned. Luke paints Paul as a major player in the life of the church. And the Apostle Paul himself is continuously aware, at least as, as far as we can tell from his writings to the church, his epistles, even the record of his statements in the book of Acts that we read later on, he's, he continues to be aware of, um, of how that experience, that road to Damascus, um, road to Damascus experience, that encounter with Jesus, shaped his whole life, as uh, Robert Raymond, uh, American theologian, has said, um, in his own, in, in a book he wrote on, on the mission, on, 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 on um, the implications for missions from the life of the Apostle Paul, uh, he says his own theology is nothing but the explication of his own conversion. And I think Paul's remembering of his conversion, and when you see him referring to it at various points in the New Testament, in his, in his letters and epistles, they bear witness to this that Paul is um, convinced about the, the, the way that first experience, this encounter he had with Jesus Christ, shaped his life forever, revealed something so unique about his mission and his calling to preach the gospel and the nature of how Jesus Christ works in the church. Um, and, and so it's important for us to as I say, to, to recognize the grace of God in the life of Paul, his unique role, um, and, and to, to study the scriptures faithfully by looking at the implications of his conversion. So there's, there's two portions in the book of um, Acts 9 that, um, there's two sections here. So I've read 19 verses to you earlier on, and these 19 verses give us the summary of Paul's conversion and maybe also his calling to, to ministry. But I think both the, uh, yeah, the, the encounter with, with, with Jesus Christ and this, uh, as, he, as he's traveling in, 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 the, in the, on that road, that, the blazing heat of that road that leads to Damascus, and there's a greater glory, a greater sun, a greater, a greater light than the sun itself that shines and blinds him, brings him down to his feet before this glorious king. Uh, there's, that, there's that, right? Up to verse 9, that tells us he's blind for three days, doesn't eat or doesn't drink. And there's also the other section that kind of completes this encounter. Uh, we're told that the apostle... Uh, encounters or meets with one Ananias who is called to confirm that work, if you want, confirm the reality of that work that Christ is doing in, his, in, in Paul's life. And that's, that I'll, I'll preach on uh, next time. So that's not next Lord's Day, but the Lord's Day after. To, 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 to this evening, I want us to look at the, a little closer at the conversion, at, at, at Paul's conversion. I think it's meant to be significant for us to, to see. Um, I remember when I was Friday, we used to have Friday meetings here, Friday Bible studies here, and we 
when we're looking at the doctrine of the resurrection or looking at the resurrection anyhow, I used to always use um, an article. It's an article by an American author, American teacher as well, um, James Montgomery Boyce. And it was about the evidences for the resurrection. Um, and he used to have a, a number of things that he says were the, the great evidences for the resurrection. The empty tomb itself, the tomb was actually empty. He, one of my favorite ones he had was the fact that the tomb was not so empty. So he makes mention about how when, when the apostles go to, when Peter goes into the tomb, and when they go into the tomb, they, they see the, 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 the grave clothes folded, right, almost in their place. So he says, listen, the, the body had, in a miraculous way, miraculous way, so the, the clothes that would have wrapped the, the, um, the corpse, that the body had so miraculously just disappeared from the body, as, uh, sorry, from the, from the grave clothes, that, that they, they just fall into place. It doesn't, you, you don't go there and see grave clothes that have been, you know, just like the, at the entrance to the tomb, as, as if Christ had just resuscitated and stumbled to the tomb and torn them. And you know, you see the grave clothes everywhere. You see them. No, you just see them fall into place. It's a miracle. Um, and then a number of other things, the, um, the, the, the change of worship to Sunday and the transformed disciples, the post-resurrection appearances. And this probably is also one of them. The conversion of the apostle is nothing less than evidence of the living Christ amongst his church. Christ is truly risen. Anyway, we come to, to see that. And ultimately, what I want to do is ask tonight, I want you to, I want to, um, to, 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 to show you how the conversion experience, I think the, the, those things that the, this experience that the Apostle Paul has here on the road to Damascus, that they teach him about the nature of the, the person of Jesus and his church. And, and, and the impact it leaves on him that we then see prevalent right through his ministry. And of course, the ministry of the Apostle Paul is the ministry that forms the very the most vital teachings of the of our faith today. And so in one sense we we we, we, we do that and by doing so we will uh, grasp the significance of the res of, of this conversion experience but also celebrate the grace of God uh, in the church and in the life of the apostle Paul. So a number of things that we we can see that um, Paul learns about the about Jesus Christ at this point, the things that he probably at least looks back to and those things, when he looks back to his conversion experience, when he looks back to Jesus Christ meeting him that day, these things form the, the very basis of his theology. This is what he then goes on to teach, essentially, obviously with further additions, with further clarity, but these are things that he may have seen at the very point when he saw Jesus that day, that he might have learned. So, uh, the first thing really comes from when we look at Saul, Saul's person, right? And what we know of him, what we can piece together of him, and realizing that ultimately Paul becomes conscious that he, he's a chosen vessel in the hand of God. He was, he was chosen. Um, and I'm simply referring to the fact that Quite simply, you can make a case for saying that Saul, Paul, now those are simply the same name. He doesn't go through an Abraham, Abraham experience. Right? It's not like God changes his name when he becomes. Saul is not a sinning name. It's not his unbelieving name. It's just a Hebrew, uh, Greek variation there. Okay, so it's the same, same person. Which one should I stick to? Let me stick to Saul. Let's say Saul today. I'm not going to make it, but okay. Um, that this, 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 the, the, the soul that we later see, um, passionate for the cause of Christ and the nature of his ministry, the, the, the things he's able to do for the cause of Christ, just the nature of his ministry. Now, the, the crucial thing that we know about the Apostle Paul and what he does is, is he's, he's able to, in a sense, you might say, he's able to take the gospel to 
peoples and to nations and to people who who the the, the first apostles probably don't have the same gift into interact with. He he's 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 the he's the he's the apostle to the Gentiles, right? He's he's able to do that. He's he's able to identify and to, to preach the message in the cities and with the pagans, maybe in a way that the 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 the, uh, the, the, the native. Jewish culture of the first apostles would have made it hard for them to do. Now, eventually, I'm sure they also did it, but it wasn't. It wouldn't have been as. It wasn't. They, they, they weren't as free as doing it as an apostle Paul was. They weren't as quick to grasp it as an apostle Paul. You might make that that um, that claim. Also, there's an aggression in how he spreads the message that he himself says. First Corinthians 15. You, this, I, I, I outwork the apostle. You, you can't read the, the epistles of the Apostle Paul without being, you, you can get grow tired from just seeing how hard he's working, how committed he is. It was nonstop. There, there, there's a, there's, a, there's a, 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 a restless zeal for these things, uh, for, 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 for spreading the, the cause of the gospel. And the, thing, the, the point I'm making is you, you take a holistic view of the life of the Apostle the Apostle Paul, you take a holistic view of Saul, and you, you see how God is preparing him for this, even whilst he's an enemy of the church, even before he comes to know his Savior, right? Saul of Tarsus, um, a man who is raised under the influence of at least three different cultures and civilizations. So Saul of Tarsus, um, um, he's, he's a diasporan Jew. He's He's living, he, he, at least his early life spent outside of his native um, Jewish land, out of, outside of Jerusalem, right? right? And, and so he, he's probably raised, and very early on is acquainted with cultures apart from his own, right? Greek culture. Paul tells us he's a Roman citizen as well, so that's Roman culture as well. So he's, he's familiar with Greek poetry and Greek writings and Greek education. He's also familiar, perhaps, far more than other Jews would be because he's, you know, he's living outside of Jerusalem with, 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 with elements of pagan religion. And you see how, later on in Paul's writings, he's comfortable at dismantling and unfolding these things and speaking to them. All this, may, you, you, we might trace back to... Um, the way God had begun to prepare this man. But he's also a, a, a Jew at heart, right? And early on in his life, he probably moves back to... Um, and in these, 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 these things we get from Paul's own words as well, later on in the book of Acts, that he studied, for example, under Gamaliel, who is referred to later on, earlier in the book of Acts. And, he, you know, Paul, Paul, remember Philippians 3, what Paul says about himself. He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He's a, he's a Pharisee. Um, he's strict in his understanding of the law. What that means also for the apostle is that he is able to speak both to the Jew and to the Gentile in a unique way, just the way he's been raised. Well, Paul himself is conscious of this, right, of, of how the the divine hand of God graciously overruled and prepare him for such a time as this. So in, in Galatians uh, chapter 1 and verse 13, Galatians 1, 13, the Apostle Paul says, For you have heard of my former life, right? It's, Paul is always conscious of this, his former life in Judaism how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace. So one of the things that just looking at the life of Paul reminds the church of is how God sovereignly chooses and elects his people, how he calls them, the wonder of grace in doing that. 
And Paul continues to be conscious of that, does he not, in his ministry. That ultimately our coming to God is a work of grace. Uh, and that the church is the gathering of the elect, the chosen of God. And he, looking at Paul, look, moves us to remember that we ought to marvel at the grace of God that is at work in our lives so that we have come to know him. Even if, for example, you say you were raised in the church all your life, or why were you raised in a family that raised you in a church? And why were they, how did they come to the faith? Um, and, and, and how did their ancestors, ancestors come to live in that part of the world where they lived, where eventually um, they came under the influence of the gospel? Uh, God's grace, God's electing grace in the life of the church. And Paul was always conscious of that. Before time began, I, before I was born, God had chosen me for this. Um, the other thing, another thing that we see that Paul would learn from his conversion experience is the richness of the mercy of God. And the Apostle Paul, again, is not... Uh, He's not quiet on this point in his, in, his, in his epistles, right? It's the mercy of God by which uh, Paul is who he is today. The richness of God's mercy he speaks of in Ephesians 2. And you know, it's obvious why Paul would, would be conscious of that. Because verse 1 says of chapter 9, but Paul was still breathing threats. This guy was just full of animosity, for this new community of people, who, by the way, he was convinced were, were enemies of the true way of Yahweh, the true way of God. They were, they were heretics. And Paul often refers to himself as a, as a, as a zealot. He's, he's burning with zeal. And you know, very often, it, 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 it seems like a, the, a kind of phrase that defined those who would they would do anything for the cause of God. And so this is how Paul is seeing himself. I'm ready to do anything. I'm ready to shed blood for the, for the, for the, for, to glorify God. He's breathing, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He's ready to have them persecuted and executed. Went to the high priest, asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, these folks who thought they knew the way to eternal life. They thought they had the way, they had found the way, when well, he wanted to be allowed to persecute them. These who call on the name of Jesus. He was ready to bring them bound to Jerusalem. Men, women, children, I'm sure, who would call them on the name of Jesus. That's what this guy was, this, this man was ready to do. He's ready to, to try and destroy God's church. All along not being conscious that, um, as he said, he was acting in ignorance and unbelief, not being conscious that he was going against the, 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 the sovereign God of the universe, an irresistible power. In another account of this, later on in the book of Acts, Paul says, Jesus says to him, it's, um, it, 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 it's pointless to kick against the goats, meaning something like, I, I, I think my will is irresistible. You can't resist my will. What are you doing trying to resist me? You can't, you can't resist me. He's a sovereign king, a sovereign God. Um, and, but, but Paul was opposing them. And having set himself up as an enemy of God, he deserved judgment. And that's why Paul never denied this. He confessed this. Uh, listen to him in 1 Timothy. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. He doesn't stop there as though he was trying to boast in his good works. He says, although formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I acted ignorant and unbelief. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a trophy of, of mercy. I'm, I'm here today because of God's mercy. In all that the apostle accomplished for the cause of Christ, in his endless devotion to the service of Jesus, in all the sacrifices he made, he never ever once thought, he never once claimed that there was even the slightest ground for boasting. He learned that day 
when Jesus saw him and had been seeing him. And Jesus, who's so powerful that just a glimpse of his light could blind him. When Jesus saw him and rather than destroy him, when Jesus saw him and rather than condemn him, when Jesus saw him and rather than strike him, because Paul didn't give glory to God. Later on in the book of Acts, where we told God, an angel of God struck Herod because Herod did not give glory to God. Jesus Christ could have struck him. But Jesus Christ says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter. But it's a but of grace. Jesus, who you are persecuting, you see that I'm far greater than you are, and I could destroy you, but I'm going to use you for my glory. But I'm going to change your life around. And the Apostle Paul became a great witness to how rich God's mercy is, regardless of who the sinner is, regardless of how far. After all, Paul said, I was a blasphemy. I persecuted the church. I I literally was trying to fight God himself. And yet, God showed me mercy. The other thing that we see uh, that colors the Apostle Paul's ministry, that he may have learned from his conversion experience, was that righteousness came apart from the law and from keeping the law of God. I just said that Paul must have been convinced that he was doing a work of righteousness by persecuting the church. And the the best place to see, right, how the apostle, um, how he considered himself prior to his conversion is a passage like Philippians uh, 3. Uh, And when we turn um, to Philippians 3, look look at what Paul says about himself, verse 4. Though I myself might have reason for confidence in the flesh also, You see, already you see how Paul began to see what trying to earn righteousness with God by keeping the law. Paul saw it as confidence in the flesh and boasting and confidence should only really be in the Lord. Confidence in the flesh is a perishing confidence. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. And so you have to remember that, that when Paul is going about on this journey, trying to persecute Christians, you are dealing with a man who is very morally upright. It's true that this is where the, the law cannot make us righteous because as much as this man thought he was morally upright, here he was also being a murderer. But it wasn't for lack of fear of the law of God. Romans 7, for example, were ended to indicate that this man lived under a serious sense of the weight of the, uh, the, the impossibility of holding the law of God. He was convinced of how holy God's law was, and he strove to try and obey it fastidiously, carefully. And this was just one other example of how Paul trumped all others in trying to maintain the law of God. He was willing to travel and do all of this and to, 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 to kill people and, to, and to, to, to drag people from their homes and to persecute them because he wanted to earn righteousness before God by keeping the law. But here is Jesus Christ. Here is the Lord himself stopping in, in his tracks, letting him know he was committing a great sin, letting him know he was persecuting the very church of God, letting him know that whilst he thought he was doing a good thing by going to persecute these men who he thought were blasphemers, you know how Paul goes on to define himself later, I was a blasphemer, because by me claiming that those folks were not righteous, and I was, I was blaspheming the very righteousness of God, by me claiming that these, by me claiming that these men and women 
who thought they didn't need to obey the law. They didn't, they didn't think they had to keep the law the way I kept the law. By me saying they were blaspheming the law of God, I was blaspheming. They were righteous even though they weren't keeping the law like I was trying to keep it because they had found righteousness and this was their claim. They had found righteousness through Christ the Messiah. And Paul thought he was the righteous one, but he wasn't. Righteousness comes through Christ alone. And this became Paul's teaching. This he began to proclaim that it's only through the grace of Jesus Christ that we can be made righteous. You can't be made righteous through any works of your own. Those, the righteous people he would have seen were the ones who were calling on Jesus, not the ones who were trying to earn their righteousness by obeying the law of God. And that became Paul's theology. And that's Paul spent the rest of his life unfolding that mystery through the grace of the Spirit, teaching it, believing it, proclaiming it, that righteousness comes apart from the law, comes through the grace of Jesus Christ. The other thing that Paul would have learned from this is that this God was constituting for himself a new people, the new people of God, that Jesus Christ was indeed forming a new community that was not defined by ethnicity alone, by Jewish ethnicity alone. He had been certain that what he was going to do was oppose those who were the opposers of the people of God. He had probably caught wind of what Stephen was, try, was impl implying with his teaching. Stephen implying that God doesn't dwell in temples. Therefore, it's possible for people who don't come to the temple to be the people of God. And Paul had seen the logic, the implication, like others didn't see. Paul says, this is blasphemous. God has one people. They are the Jews. God has one people. They are those who join themselves to the Jews. It's impossible to say or to preach a message that suggests that non-Jews, that Gentiles, could be the people of, the, of God in their Gentile communities, where they are. Paul was certain of that. And he was about to go and find those Christians who scattered to Damascus will begin to preach that message there and tell those in Damascus that they could be the people of God where they were. He was going there to find those communities because Paul was sure that they were enemies of God and not his people. But Jesus Christ stops him in his tracks and says, those are my people, Paul. Christ stops him in his tracks and says, in the most miraculous, intimate way, you are persecuting me. And Paul would have learned at that point that it's true, Jesus Christ, was forming for himself, and God is forming for himself a new people, a new community. The people of God are those who call upon Jesus, not those who live in a particular area, not those who call to a, who, who are in a particular temple. And so the people of God can include Gentiles, can include people who didn't grow up in a, in, in, with, with the Jewish tradition. Because as long as you call on the name of Jesus, and as you belong to this Jesus, and they weren't calling upon the name of Jesus in the temple, unless the Christians went there, anywhere this Jesus is called, and of course, Paul saw that because this Jesus was sovereign, he was in the sky, he was everywhere, anywhere this Jesus is called upon, those people are the people of God. And Paul gave his life to proclaiming this as well. That... Um, in Jesus Christ, that middle wall, that dividing wall of hostility has been broken down. That Jesus is our peace. That um, there is no difference between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and gives richly to all those who call on him. He was convinced 
about what it now meant to be the people of God. It didn't mean to have Jewish origins. It's all those who call upon the name of Jesus. Just two more things. The next thing that we know that Paul is convinced of, surely, by his encounter with Jesus on this road to Damascus, is the he, Christ's union with his people. And Paul is the... Uh, is the theologian par excellence of union with Christ, right? Now, of course, other other um, authors and writers in the New Testament teach us about the about uh, union with Christ, but none like the Apostle Paul, none with the same depth that Christ is un- united to His people. He tells us that Jesus Christ is the head to his church. You can't dismember the head from the body without losing the whole thing. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He tells us that Christ is, is, is the church is Christ's bride. Uh, what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. And he, you, you, you know how he had to have gotten that from the words of the Savior. Jesus Christ doesn't say, and this is not simply a, a metaphor, as it were. It's not just simply that. I think Jesus is really saying to, to, to the Apostle Paul, an attack on my church is an attack on me. So, so, why are you persecuting me? He says, who are you, Lord? I'm, who are you? I've never seen you. I've never met you. And Christ doubles down on that, can I say? I, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And the Apostle Paul is certain, Saul is certain, he's only been persecuting people. He's only been persecuting these, 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 this, these, these random people who call on the name of Jesus. I've never t- tried to persecute a divine being. That's exactly what he was attempting to do, what he was doing in attacking the people of Christ. Because Christ is united to his people. Because there's a union. And Jesus Christ, and Paul learned about that. He learned about the, 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 the endless depth of Christ's love for his church. He learned how, where the church is, Christ is. Uh, I was, I was, again, I was in the membership classes this afternoon, I was talking to the folks about how Christ demonstrates his authority in the church. And we read from 1 Corinthians 5, where where the Apostle Paul is talking about the church gathering for church discipline. And when he gathered for church discipline, he says, you gather in the presence of Christ. You're assembled in the presence of Jesus. Paul was convinced of that, right? From, From now on, he would remember in the most, in the, in the most, uh, indelible way that Jesus was one with his people. Jesus is one with his church. You're united to him. And he proclaimed that all, the, all his days to his people, to, 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 to those who he preached to. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you receive all that Christ has. You are no longer under law. You're under grace. You can't continue in sin because Christ is your Lord. You, 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 in fact, you don't even live on this earth in one way, in one sense. Because if you're united, and you really are united to Christ, and he lives in heaven, you live in heaven. Your life is hidden above with Christ. We were so convinced of our union with Jesus Christ. Because he heard it from Christ himself. Christ spoke these words to him. The living Christ. Appeared to him. And obviously, and Paul knew, if he appeared to me, he appeared to me for a reason, that I may proclaim him, proclaim his truth. And the last thing then to say is that Paul was convinced of the greater glory of Jesus Christ. Again, all through the scriptures, the glory of Christ is proclaimed, but no one proclaims with the same ardor, you might say, the same clarity that Jesus is Lord of all. That Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. No one proclaims like the Apostle Paul that he is before all things. 
and in him all things all hold together. No one proclaims that like him. Right? He became convinced of that, the glory of Jesus, as we sung, all glory be to Christ. Paul, right after saying in Philippians 3, right, that he, he was blameless as touching the righteousness that is under the law, says, but I counted all of that as dung, as rubbish. No one can wait to extol the all-sufficiency of Jesus like Paul does. And a lot of it surely is owed to his experience here. That was on his journeys to persecute the church, when the risen Christ appears to him, it's in such a glorious way. The glory, a light from heaven shining around him, a light that brings him down to the ground, brings him and lays him prostrate on the ground. A voice with authority that speaks to him, that knows his name, and then commissions him and leaves him blinded as though he might learn that the glory of Jesus Christ outshines the sun and is, is eye-blinding. And Paul never lost that conviction. He never lost the sense. Jesus Christ is glorious. Far more glorious than anything I sought my life pursuing. Far more glorious than anything else I've ever wanted. Christ is glorious, all-sufficient, and is enough. He, he's worthy to be praised. And I don't care. I, I, I could lose all reputation. I could lose my name if Christ be proclaimed. He was so, he, he was so caught up by the recognition that Jesus is so more glorious than him and that Jesus deserves all the praise and glory that one time while he was in prison because of the gospel, he was in prison because he was preaching the gospel, there were some people, it's a strange situation, who claimed to be Christians but for some reason didn't like him and to try and make things worse for him they were flirting their liberty of being able to preach the gospel. They, they did it in almost a strange way to try and show him, oh, look at you, you're in, you're in prison. They, they, they had wicked motives, selfish motives. It's a strange thing. None of us would want to accept a preacher, right, in this pulpit that we knew, we, we know their life and we see a lot of selfishness in their life, a lot of greed, it matters. If I came to this church tomorrow, I saw someone preach a faithful gospel, but I knew there was a selfish motive there. He, he's doing it for money. Out, out, out. We want to clear him out. But he was so hungry, so passionate for the glory of Christ that Paul put two and two together. He said, okay, what these guys are doing is only I'm the one suffering. They're only attacking me. But the name of Jesus is magnified. The name of Jesus is glorified. The name of Jesus is proclaimed. You know what he did? Paul went and brought a microphone. He bought a microphone for them. Right? That's, that's what Paul did. Paul said, I'm going to, listen, what do you need? So you can keep on being able to proclaim the gospel. He, he was so passionate to see Christ proclaimed. He, he knew that Jesus was worthy of all the glory. And he meant it. When he, when he says, he's, you're worthy of all the glory, he really meant that. It wasn't just a song. It wasn't just words. It was how life was meant to be. All things for the glory of Christ. Both preaching, his preaching ministry, of course, but everything else, our, our resources, our, our, our giftings, our families, our trials, our hopes, our ambitions, all we ever hoped to be, all for the glory of Jesus, our, our leisure, our, our pleasure, our politics, you name it, for the glory, let Jesus be glorified. Let me say those things to you. He, he learned um, about God's electing grace. He learned about the richness of the mercy of God. He, he learned about righteousness that comes apart from the law. He learned about this new community that God had formed in Christ, the new people of God. He learned about the union of Christ with his church. He learned about the glory of Jesus, the greater glory of Jesus Christ. Well, let me close by saying this, I'm in no doubt that, above all things, the Apostle Paul would want us to learn from this story how powerful Christ is to save. Jesus is able to save. 
He's living with his church and he saves. And that we must be inspired by this to continue to pray and seek the salvation of sinners, to continue to trust and expect that Christ's power is put forth for the benefit of the church. Christ is with us. And in his own time, he will call his people to come and send them forth. Jesus Christ is with his church. And so we must never lose hope. We must continue to be confident. The worst type of sinners. And let Jesus shine his glory. Right? In, in a true sense, although it's not the same way, we go through what the Apostle Paul went through. We also are enemies of God. We also are running from God. And in God's mercy, when he meets with us, he doesn't destroy us. Rather, he shines. He shines his glory in our lives. And he humbles us and we fall down to our feet. And we see that we've been running from him. We've been enemies of God. And rather than destroy us, he extends grace and mercy to us. And we, we come to see that outside of Christ, we were blinded until he removes the scales from our eyes. In a true sense, we meet with the same Jesus who says, I'm one with my people. I love my people. And we enter into that same love. And the apostle will, would want us to be inspired by this, to, uh, to seek Christ's glory, to continue to be shown abroad. Let me close by reading... Um, Two stanzas from a hymn. It's, I think partially I was, I was stunned that someone had written a hymn just on this uh, subject, on this, um, on this chapter. Um, and I'm going to read the first and the closing chapter. It's by uh, an English author. It's an it's a old, older hymn, 19th century um, hymn. Um, called, uh, well, the first line is, We Sing the Glorious Conquest. It's written by someone called John Ellerton. And he says, We, we sing the glorious conquest before Damascus Gate. When, church, when Saul, the church's spoiler, came breathing threats and hate. The ravening wolf rushed forward, full early to the prey. But lo, the shepherd met him and bound him fast today. Lord, teach your church the lesson, still in her darkest hour, of weakness and of danger, to trust your hidden power, your grace by ways mysterious, the wrath of man can bind. And in your boldest foeman, that means your enemy, your chosen saint can find. Amen.